Rhea Ripley has to give up that women's championship. And it sucks because after that big match she just had at WrestleMania with Becky Lynch that had a lot of people talking, uh, she is no longer your champion. And we're going to have a new champion crowned next week on Monday Night Raw. Um, It had to be tough being in that ring and give up that championship after what she has just gone through and the reign that Rhea Ripley has had. Listen, I know on the surface it sounds bad. It's not necessarily bad. It's not like she got hurt before WrestleMania. She got through WrestleMania. Okay? She got injured. Now she's going to go away for a little while. Sometimes, what do they say about absence, Dave? Yeah, it makes the, the heart grow fonder. Same thing in wrestling. Sometimes when you go away for a little while... It makes the fans yearn for you to come back and get excited for you when you come back. Rhea Ripley has been positioned as a heel. It's the fans who are into her. She's got a great entrance. She's got a phenomenal look. She gets the job done in the ring. COVID WrestleMania, I thought her and Charlotte stole the show. This time away is going to be good for Rhea. Recharge your battery. Heal your injury. And when Rhea Ripley comes back, when they hit her music on her return, WWE will have a monster woman baby face on their hands in Rhea Ripley. And I think they're already planting the seeds for that already. A couple different things. Coming out of WrestleMania, even before WrestleMania, there's a laundry list of WWE superstars that are either going to be on the shelf because of injury or... Because they're taking time off. Obviously, we know The Rock is going to be gone for a while. Roman, we're not going to see Roman for a bit here. Seth Rollins, Becky Lynch, Rhea Ripley now with this injury. Charlotte Flair is still out. CM Punk is still out with the injury. Those are some major, major superstars that are now on the shelf or taking time off. This is really the best time for other people to step up and show up. And I think we saw that a little bit last night, but it's going to be interesting. But a bully, we said it on the show yesterday, but now we know it more than ever. These other superstars, now's your opportunity. Seize the opportunity because you're going to have that opportunity coming off the heels of the biggest WrestleMania of all time. Every week coming up, whether it's Raw or SmackDown, and we still got the draft coming in a couple of weeks, so the big shakeup. No matter what hand you're dealt, Play it to your maximum ability. Go out there and get over. And show creative why you should be positioned to be the next champion. That's that's it, Dave. You, it, you know, in poker, you have two choices with every hand you're dealt. You can play the hand or you can fold. In wrestling... You can play what creative gives you, or you can fold. You fold, you're done, especially at that level. And you don't need the greatest hand in the world to win at the World Series of Poker. Think about that, Dave. You don't need the best cards in your hand to defeat your opponent. You just need to know how to outwork your opponent. That's why pro wrestlers are also poker players. We're actors, we're athletes, we're poker players, we're magicians, we're psychologists, we're all of those. And when you learn how to master all of those aspects, you become a big deal in this business. So no matter what you're handed, I'm I'm just talking to the ladies right now because it's a big spot open because of Rhea. No matter what you're handed, go out there and immerse yourself in it. Get it so over. Force them to give you another look. And, you know, we see it all over. Think about this, like, and Drew McIntyre has seen himself in big positions, but I think we would all agree the work that Drew McIntyre was doing leading up to WrestleMania 40 was the best work of his career bully. Why did we get that opportunity? Because CM Punk got injured. Because of CM Punk's injury, because we all thought it was going to be Seth Rollins and CM Punk at WrestleMania 40, right? But because of that injury, Drew McIntyre stepped up And we saw the best work of Drew's career. So somebody that we thought was lost and that was going to fall to the wayside, 
Look what he's doing right now. He's doing the best work of his career. Paul just brought, sent this note to me, and this is true as well. Because of injuries, we saw an AEW Tony Storm show the best work of her, her career and got everybody talking, right? Britt Baker's out. Tony Storm shows up, shows out, and is now your women's champion and has a character and personality unlike any other character or personality that we've seen from Tony Stor- Storm or in AEW. Take advantage of those opportunities because you may never get those opportunities again. Dave, many times in the wrestling industry, opportunity comes because somebody else gets injured or somebody leaves a territory. When me and Devon first started to get a push, you know, we were progressing along. We were doing okay. The public enemy left. Paul immediately put us in the public enemy spot. It's not like we, you know, for years and years had, you know, built ourselves up and proven ourselves. We proved ourselves after we were given an opportunity because the team left. And many opportunities have come to many talents in the business because of others getting injured. It's just the nature of the beast. If you have a three ring circus and one of the acts in one of the rings go down, you're not going to leave that ring empty. You have to put another act in and have it ready to go. And that act may have never thought that their opportunity was going to come on that day. But when that opportunity presents itself, bang, you better be ready to go. You better be as good as, if not better, than the act that was there before you. Now, listen, it's funny how things happen. It's funny how things fall into place. I agree with you. We saw it with Edge. We saw it with Cody Rhodes. When you come back from injury, you're going to come back bigger than ever because, like you said, somebody that we saw each and every week, we're not seeing anymore. So when they come back, we're going to, we're going to give them open arms to their return. This is really going to help Liv Morgan. It's funny how this went down. Because I'm sorry. Go ahead. They have to, have to take advantage of this for Liv Morgan. Liv has been on the cusp a couple of times now, but never has been able to really push through. With this injury, this is an opportunity. Liv has, as we've said before, Liv has a very loyal fan base. Liv is not the greatest wrestler in the world, but you don't have to be. Liv can now build an entire story, angle, and new aspect of her persona going, little old me. Little old Liv Morgan is the one that took Rhea Ripley out. It's so simple, and I think they will take advantage of it. Yeah, and, 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 and I think they definitely will. And it's funny how this all came down because we interviewed Liv Morgan last Monday, our last day out in Philadelphia before coming home after WrestleMania 40. And this is what Liv Morgan told us during that interview. The Liv Morgan Revenge Tour is very much on, and thank you. And um, I sat back and watched, you know, the shows the last two nights, and exactly what I wanted to happen, happened. And so I'm very, very happy today. I'm very, very, very excited for tonight, and if I were you guys, I'd make sure I'd watch me. Okay, okay. I like it. So think about that. She said that WrestleMania went exactly the way she wanted it, meaning Rhea Ripley retained the championship. And she goes, just watch me tonight. Now, I don't think we thought we were going to get what happened to Rhea Ripley on Monday Night Raw, where Rhea Ripley was going to be out for a significant amount of time. I don't think that was ever the plan. But sometimes things fall into place. Because the fans love Rhea Ripley so much, and the fans think that Liv Morgan was the cause of Rhea Ripley being gone, now instantly Liv Morgan becomes the most hated woman in the WWE. They need to take advantage of that situation. I I believe they will. It it would be asinine not to. It would be just pure stupidity to not allow Liv Morgan to scream at the top of her lungs, I'm the one who took out Rhea Ripley. I'm your, oh, oof, <laughs> ooh, ooh. listen to this idea that just popped into my head. Liv goes up to Dominic and says, I'm your mommy now. 
I mean, listen, I mean, we, we'll get into that as well because the future of the Judgment Day, a little bit in doubt here with Rhea Ripley being gone. And also you saw a little bit of dissension between the members last night on Raw. But we'll get to that in just a little bit. But I love where you're going. Imagine if in her absence she filled in the void of Rhea Ripley. And you know what? The only way you can do that is with that championship. So we'll see if Liv Morgan winds up being your women's champion. But there's also some truth to what Liv Morgan said last night on Raw. But before we get to that, I believe, and you just hinted at it, and this is why I buy into Liv Morgan now than ever at any point in her career. I think you would agree, Bully. Seeing Liv Morgan in the ring with Shayna Baszler, seeing Liv Morgan in the ring with Ronda Rousey, it was a little too much. How am I going to buy into Liv Morgan being able to get out of any hold that Shayna Baszler or Ronda Rousey puts on her. Come on now. That that now you're asking that that's I know pro wrestling is a little bit buying into the disbelief, but that's a little bit even for the most hardcore Liv Morgan fan to buy into. Shayna and Ronda are legit killers. Yeah. Liv Morgan is not a legit killer at all. No. But Liv Morgan playing this type of role where she's going to cheat to win this Liv Morgan that's going to take advantage of situations just because that's the type of person she is right now. That's a Liv Morgan I can buy into, Bully. And I think that everybody can buy in. So this Liv Morgan as a heel is going to be a great character change for her. But let's listen into what Liv Morgan had to say last night on Monday Night Raw. You know, Kathy, I can't even lie. I'm a little bit confused by that reaction. I feel like I'm walking around back here and everyone is mad at me. And for what? I'm not the bad guy here. Where was the sympathy for me when Rhea literally tore my shoulder out of my socket and put me on the shelf for eight months? Oh, yeah. There wasn't any. So you know what? An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. A shoulder for a shoulder. (laughs) This is karma at its very finest. And Rhea got exactly what she deserved. Do you want to know what the best part is? This isn't the end of the Liv Morgan revenge tour, no. This is just the beginning because the end is Liv Morgan as your women's world champion. <laughs> Again, a lot of truth to what Liv Morgan is saying, Bully, because, yeah, Rhea Ripley tore her shoulder out and then Liv was gone for eight months. Did you hear a lot of people calling in to bust it open? Or did you see where's Liv signs? Did she get a a hero's welcome when she came back? The answer to all those questions is no. She was kind of just like, all right, Liv's gone. Let's move on. That's that, There's a lot of truth to what Liv said last night. And, and thus, like, after I heard that again, it's like, yeah, I don't really hate her. All is fair in love and war. You know, you did this to me. I did this to you. You came back over the top with this. I did this to you. Now you're on the shelf for six months. Deal with it. I'm going to take your title and your boyfriend. So they just have to allow her to go out there in front of people and soak in the heat. I'm the one who did this. Blame me. And this kind of reminds you a little bit of Drew McIntyre too, Bully. Because when Drew McIntyre was talking, leading into that story with Seth and their match, didn't Drew spit a lot of truth in what he was saying as well? Sure. Same thing. Like, you guys forgot about me. Who is the one that carried this championship during the toughest time ever in WWE history? It was me. And then when I lost it, you just completely forgot all about me. Blaming the fans has been going on for a long time. Ever since, uh, you know, Mick Foley, uh, Cactus Jack, and ECW blamed the fans for all of his injuries because they were bloodthirsty, thus he had to work the hardcore style. Um, So yeah, blaming fans is something we've seen done over and over again. It's just how you go about blaming the fans in this story. Like you just said with with, um, Drew McIntyre. I don't think they do it with Liv. There's nothing to blame on the fans. But... She should blame it. You brought this on yourself, Rhea Ripley. You did all these things to me, and you forgot about me, but I never forgot about you. 
Now you can sit home and think about me every minute of every hour of every day. They should they should do things where you know you know I I don't know maybe one day you know they they they're they're at Rhea Ripley's house and Rhea Ripley is doing a sit down interview with uh, you know somebody on dot com and the doorbell rings and there's a dozen roses, you know and the roses are from you know, dear Rhea hope you don't get well soon love live, that's a real kick in the ass. I love your idea about her trying to get herself into the judgment day, her warming Without herself up to Dom. And, you know, so listen, what we saw from Rhea last night, she said, guys, you know, keep hanging in there. I'm going to be got like, she really, it's not like we're going to, it seemed like to me, bully, it's not like we're going to see Rhea week in and week out with the judgment day, even though she's not wrestling, she could have been side by side with priest and Finn and Dom. That's not the case. She walked out and said, you know, hope to see you soon. Good luck. I would love for Liv to try to fill that void of the Judgment Day. And what was the last thing that Rhea said to the Judgment Day before she walked off? What was that? She either said, take care of the boy or take care of the kid. Walked away and Dom went, love you, mommy. And imagine, imagine Liv were to come out there and cut a promo and go, oh, Rhea, don't worry. I'm going to take care of the boy very well. As a matter of fact, I, I might be the you know I might be the new head of the Judgment Day by the time you get back. She can go after Rhea with the Judgment Day, with Dom, with the injury, with taking the championship. There's so much good stuff right in front of Liv Morgan. Let's see if Creative gives it to her. There was one thing that bothered me a little bit. Now listen, Rhea may be gone for a significant amount of time. It seems like she is going to be gone for a significant amount of time. But she, when she was in that middle of the ring last night, you know, giving up that Women's World Championship, it got me thinking about Roman and Seth. Because what did I always say, especially when it came to Roman? He never defends the championship. And, you know, same thing, like Seth got injured. He didn't need to defend his championship. So when I saw Rhea giving up that championship last night, it did remind me of the fact that we had two world champions and Seth and Roman at a time that where they weren't defending those championships. I can buy into your Seth argument more than your Roman argument because within storyline, Triple H got us around that hiccup. He said that Roman negotiated a contract in which he didn't have to defend his championship every 30 days. Triple H went on to say, wow, I wish I was smart enough to negotiate something like that when I was wrestling. So they were able to put a Band-Aid on that. So even if you're screaming at the top of your lungs, how come Roman's not defending? Well, Triple H told us why. It, it, it might not have been a perfect fix, but it was some type of a fix. Maybe just like a wrestler can negotiate, Hulk Hogan negotiated creative control in WCW. Unheard of, but it was legit. Maybe Roman negotiated, I don't have to uh, wrestle every 30 days if I become champion. And maybe the WWE agreed to it. So I get that. With Seth, I understand the argument a little more. Well, Seth was hurt. Why didn't he have to relinquish his championship? Well, because he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you'll be back in six weeks, you'll be able to perform at WrestleMania. So they rode around it. Yeah, it's just that even even with the Roman thing, and I get what you're saying, but to me it is a bit of a Band-Aid for a gunshot wound. But, like, you got to be careful. Those are the things I said, because I even said it at the time. The next time we see somebody give up their championship because they're injured, hey, we're going to have to bring this up in the fact that you had champions that weren't defending the championship every 30 days. So, listen, if Rhea's gone for six months, obviously, okay, I understand why, because she was gone for a, a long, significant amount of time. But if if she pops up in two and a half, three months, they're going to have to explain that why she had to give up that championship board. Other champions didn't have to defend that title every 30 days. Just saying. It, it's kind of like one of the things that we talked about with like the replay like, when you start using replay yeah. in pro wrestling, you're setting a precedent. Well, if you use instant replay for this match, you got to do it for every match. Oh, well, the shoulders were up. 
Well, then, you know, if he, then you got to use it, like I said, for everything. So I, I, get, I get your point. They could probably tighten their screws going forward with, uh, in relation to the 30-day the rule. We'll definitely talk NXT with our next guest, and that is one of the true originals, Bully, in the world of professional wrestling. And it's fun now. We could, when we talk about WWE, we could actually say pro wrestling. I love that as well. And that's Mr. Carl Anderson who joins us right now. Sir, how are you? And thank you so much for the time. I'm doing great. Thank you guys for having me. Um, it's just probably people probably think we're missing right now because we're just we're missing and we're, we're missing in action a little bit from from uh, waiting, biding our time for to explode onto the scene. But uh, it's good to good to see you guys. It's always good seeing you. But, you know, we saw you last in NXT and we've seen a lot yes. of main roster influx on NXT. You know, what was it like being a part of that show and being a part of that brand? That was fun. Jeez, you know, it's uh, having the opportunity to go down there and seeing the uh, and seeing guys that are truly new to professional wrestling and like the, the, a couple of the kids that we worked uh, about a month ago that we wrestled with were you know they're only two years in pro wrestling and only uh two years into training and so being able to talk with them about talking through a match and and talking inside the ring about a match and then after the after the match, listening and talking to them about the match, it just was kind of fun to to be able to talk to kid to, to legitimate kids that are 23, 24, 25 years old that were are, are are hungry and they're really hungry too because they're 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 passionate about the business. It was it's it's been cool to go down there and see that. Carl, I, I I've said on the show many times I don't believe the WWE took full advantage of you and Gallows on the main roster and the team that you are, especially with your great uh, tag team finish that you have. Tell me about what goes through your mind if you're not being used the way you guys think you should be used and then getting the call to go to NXT. Do you look at that as a negative? I, I, I don't think any of us look at that as a negative, but how did you view it? How did your partner view it? How do you, how do you, you know, take it all in and, and deal with it? Yeah. So, you know, to, to answer the first uh, bully, it's like, I don't know if so much of it's not being used the way we think we should be used. I think it's just, you know, WWE, sometimes you gotta, you, you gotta sit and you gotta, take your time you got to be patient and you got to you got to wait you know you, you can we're competitive guys right so we always want to be used we always want to be on tv we're always ready and willing to go and we want to be on raw we want to be on smackdown we want to be on all the pleds but sometimes you got to take a step back because there's a lot of guys there a lot of girls there there's a lot of stuff going on especially with the last year just the last couple of years the way it's been so you got to be patient um so getting the and also getting the call to go to NXT, zero negative. If anything, we got the text as we were. I believe we were we were actually driving to SmackDown that day. We got the group text about going to NXT from one of the writers, and it just excited us. I mean, just to to, to be able. We've been doing this for a long time, right? Over twenty years. So just to for us to get in the ring, talk wrestling, you know, talk about promos, talk about storyline physically get in the ring and do it, it still excites us. I mean, that's the only thing that really keep, gets me going anymore in the world besides watching my kids at a home run or something. But, um, and so being able to go to NXT, total positive. You know, we did it for about a month. I think it was a month or five weeks or whatever it was. And it was, I, 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 I wouldn't mind it being more. I, any chance we get to be in a pro wrestling ring, like we're just ready. You know, Carl, it's it's funny because you said talking to the kids and literally you are talking to kids like it's pretty amazing that NXT class of 2021. It's going to go down as one of the greatest classes ever. And, and, and it's and it sounds crazy because it's 2021. We're in 2024. Yeah. And, you know, Trick Williams, Braun Breaker, Carmelo Hayes, Cora Jade, Tony D'Angelo, those 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 wrestlers just 
a week or so ago was wrestling in front of 10,000 fans. You know, Trick and Carmelo Hayes are in the main event tomorrow, uh, tonight, you know, in, in, a, in a cage. It gets pretty insane when you talk about they were in the class of 2021. Now, some of that class had independent wrestling experience. Some of them didn't. Some of them are come like Tony D'Angelo is going right from collegiate athletics to going to pro wrestling. Like when you look at that and, you know, knowing in a lot of ways, and we'll get into Tama Tonga, how long it took him to get to the world of the WWE. When you yeah, look course. at these young athletes going right from collegiate athletics to the world of pro wrestling and then being on national TV. Like, it's pretty crazy when you think about that, right? It's nuts. And it, it's totally opposite of, of the way I came up in, in pro wrestling, but I'm totally for it. I, I love it. It's a different, it's a different thought process. It's a different idea. I mean, this, it, you have no, no better people or a better place to go. Of course, besides Bully Ray's wrestling school, but you can go to NXT and learn from the absolute best. I mean, you've got Shawn Michaels down there, Shawn Michaels, right? Arguably the greatest of all time, right? But being able to go there directly from college and you're not going, you're not learning anything, anything bad. You're not going and doing independence that you might not learn the right way. And if you've got a passion for pro wrestling, and you love it and you can feel it and you can and you can get placed in this NXT, why not take advantage of it? I mean, why not take advantage of, of the opportunities that are being thrown to you? I, I like I, I like it a lot. Of course, I still have a lot of love for people that do come up the uh, the, the original way of, of doing the wrestling school, going through the independence. I mean, the way I did, the way you mentioned what Tama did and um, the way Gallows did, it's uh. There's it's two different ways to look at it. I love both. And if you can come directly from a big time college football or college wrestling or college lacrosse, whatever you're doing, or college soccer or anything, I mean, you're, you're used to being in athletics, you know? Yeah. But a quick question. So I know you yeah. said you like both both sides and, you know, you're paying your dues no matter what you're you're doing and you're learning. Like I look at a Tony D'Angelo, somebody that we spoke to just a few weeks ago. Tony D'Angelo being on main event matches on national TV, just coming in doing, you know, doing pro wrestling for the first time starting in 2021. So two and a half years later, he's on TV. Is it better for somebody to come up from a collegiate background, being a part of NXT, learning from a Shawn Michaels and a Terry Taylor and being a part of that system that, as opposed to being on the independent scene? Because you just said it. Carl, in a lot of ways, not everybody's being taught by a bully ray in the Team 3D Academy. A lot of times you're you're wrestling and maybe you're being taught the wrong way. So is there a better better opportunity for growth and understanding coming up the way like a Tony D'Angelo did? I think there's a I think there's a possibility. I think both are, are are amazing, right? You, you but how can you go wrong? doing it this way how, how can you go wrong coming in and listening to some of the greats and the in those minds that they have in nxt you know it, it, i can take it to, to my own uh personal with me like being able i went from the independence like directly from the independence to new japan pro wrestling and then so my first couple of big new japan pro wrestling pay-per-views were in front of ten thousand or twelve thousand, and then you know i get a chance to do a tokyo dome and that feels that's felt overwhelming at the time and like the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. But then fast forward there. So I was eight years in new Japan doing it in front of big crowds and I got more and more comfortable. So when we debuted at Staples center in 2016 on Monday night raw, I was ready for it. I felt, I mean, I felt like I've been in front of a lot of big crowds. So I felt prepared, you know? And so, but if you've got Shawn Michaels teaching you, you've got Terry Taylor teaching you, you've got these guys in NXT talking to you and you've come from the college world where you've had, you've scored a touchdown in front of 50,000 people or however many people there are in front of, you know, watching these athletics. I think that prepares you just as well too. And you're, and you're, and you're being a sponge and you're taking in everything that you can from who you're learning from in NXT. I think it, there's, it's two awesome. I mean, it's two awesome different preparations. Carl, uh, thank you for the props and the love on the wrestling school. I do appreciate that, brother. Um, I want to take you back in time 
to the inception of the Bullet Club. You an OG member, original member. Uh, I remember uh, watching the movie The Dirt about the about the rock and roll band Motley Crue, where they where they showed us the table that they were sitting at when Mick Mars came up with the name of the band Motley Crue. Do you guys remember where you were? who you were sitting with and who first said the words bullet club 100 percent. i uh, they put us together we'd already been traveling together this time was probably 2000 was it 2013 we'd been together now five years on the road always on the new japan pro wrestling buses you know flying all over that country they put us together so we were already had an awesome bond and when you say we, who are you talking about right now? So, so, so talking about, so he's still in New Japan for wrestling right now. There was a guy named Fale, Bad Luck Fale, had just turned had just turned heel. Prince Devitt was about to get his big push. Now Finn Balor in WWE. Tama Tonga and myself, we kind of each were kind of drifting off into our own little solo things, but nothing really had clicked. They threw us together. This is how amazing this name came about, uh, Bully. Ferg, uh, Ferg, uh, Prince Devitt, Finn Balor goes, they asked me what uh, they think the name should be. What do you think? I said, I don't care, Ferg, tell me. He said, I think Bullet Club. I said, beautiful. I love the sound of it. That was it. That was the, that was it. That was the final thing. There was no discussion. No, uh, I, I'm a, I'm a creative guy. I like to be involved in stuff, but for some reason I just, and I, and if you get to know Prince David, you get to know Finn Balor, he likes to be in control of things. Nothing wrong with that. I gave, I gave him that. I said, tell you, figure it out, good brother. Let me know. And I, when I heard the name, I went, you know, I was called the machine gun in new Japan. I was always, um, I went by that for the, all the years I was there. He said that he tied that in and it came together and I, and, and crazy, it just it just took off, man. And you know, it it really it changed the game for us over there. So I I, I want to follow that up with one of your brothers in the Bullet Club, an OG member, Tama Tonga. Tama has been out there doing this for a long time, you know, in New Japan, and and really trying to make a name for himself on his own. And along with his uh, brother Tonga Loa, as a member of God, God, the Gorillas of Destiny, who who've had success in Japan in, in Ring of Honor, I think Tama Tonga is a perfect fit in the WWE. Do you agree? And if so, what about him and his personality is going to work in the WWE? Yes. Yes. I mean, and look at him. I mean, I think he's got the perfect look. I mean, I think he's got exactly what, um, what WWE needs, wants. And I think it's great, like to, to go back to what we were talking about with the college, the, the college kids coming in straight to, to, uh, the WWE and not having any independent experience. I think it's great that Thomas had 15 or 16 years, all in new Japan pro wrestling to come into WWE and and show them that experience and that he that he is ready for prime time i think i think that 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 it's unlimited right now for what tama tonga can pull off in the wwe i'm ex i'm excited to watch man I, I just knowing that he was coming the last friday he had texted me and I, and told me he was gonna he was in, he was gonna show up in the city he had no clue he was going to debut that night either, which is kind of WWE style. They'll bring you in, and then they, then you got a debut. And they told him he was debuting, and it was pretty pretty fun to see. Just watch my friend and brother go through the fact that he knows he's about to go on live, you know, national television for the first time ever, really. And um, I'm, I'm proud of him. Like he, I thought he knocked it out of the park. He looked amazing, which he always does. And I think he's ready. And I think the, the world's ready for Tom. And I think his attitude, the way he is, he's an opinionated guy. He's a charismatic guy. He's a bit insane, which is, you know, part of kind of what, what we all need. And uh, I, I, I can't wait to see where it's at. I'm so glad he's in that Bloodline storyline because now he's involved with the tippy top guys. He's got Paul Heyman right there, who's always creatively the genius that he is. It's It doesn't get much cooler, especially if you're a Bullet Club fan and have followed for so long. 
one of the things that I well, we were talking about yesterday, along with Mark Henry, seeing mm-hmm. Solo Sokoa and Tama Tonga next to each other last week. Solo is the is the silent assassin in the bloodline. Tama, to me, is the complete opposite. He is the crazy-eyed killer, and I and I compared his his facials to like um, any player who did the haka when you know in uh, for the Australian football team or New Zealand football team, yes. where his eyes can open up so wide, and when that tongue comes out of his mouth, his facial expression, he looks like an insane maniac this is more of a statement than it is a question but you have seen that that characteristic that insane maniacal aspect to tama tonga that is so over the top it's almost like that that's exactly what the wwe would want i was with fale and i was with tama tonga for you know eight years on the road and and it was more than just in the in the ring it was all it was you know we're together and we're in you know bars or restaurants or wherever it was and i've seen that i've seen that insane look that you're talking about when things have gotten sketchy or whatever it's, it's gotten wherever it is in real life and i've always said i'm very happy and fortunate that tama tonga has my back and that's if i ever get into a sticky situation i can say hey you know i can always call on a brother that can really seriously truly do some damage if he needs to and he doesn't ever have to but if he needs to i'm glad i want him on my side you know carl for me and and i always give the fans perspective on this show because i'm first and foremost a fan and i've mentioned this to bully and i was talking about it with mark as well on our show yesterday as a fan i'm very happy of this new era in the wwe and obviously smackdown from this past friday would be the prime example we heard cody uh, Cody Rhodes mentioned the NWA and how him and AJ Styles both carried that NWA championship. You know, when Tama Tonga came into the ring, they referenced New Japan. They talked about the length that Tama Tonga was in Japan. They're using Tama Tonga. You know, there had been a time yeah. in the WWE they would probably call him something else. And Bully and I had the debate on PG the air Kid about... Jr. Yeah, so who knows? <laughs> But, yeah. bu- but Bully and I had the idea. I love the fact that Corey Graves and Wade Barrett mentioned that. They didn't say, who the hell's that guy? What, what is, why is that guy in the ring? They they referenced him, that's Tom Atonga. Like It does feel like the WWE right now has no problem talking about the world of pro wrestling outside of their walls. You know, Art, it, this is a... This is... The, that's the real deal. It, like it's it's the Triple H era, right? I mean, that's kind of feels like it's what they keep saying, and it's what it feels like one hundred percent. That you know, our contract was ending in with WWE in two thousand and nineteen, and we weren't sure what was happening. And we sat with with Triple H. We sat with Hunter for a, a, a lot of a, a ton of meetings, where we to the point where we got really close, and we our full blown you know Triple H guys then. You know, we ended up leaving WWE for a couple of years because whatever happens, happens. And I, I'm a big believer of things happening for a reason. And and the person that reached out to bring us back to the WWE was Triple H. And I mean, you know, we FaceTimed him and we, we – I fully understand why – this new era is coming in. I mean, Triple H has, is, is, is Triple H. He knows what he's he, – he knows what he wants, what he wants from this era – and uh, after my Tokyo Dome match in 2023, which Triple H let me do, because I we signed back with WWE and I was still a champion in New Japan, and he still allowed me to go back and do two more dates with New Japan Pro Wrestling with no issue at all. But I remember texting Triple H and telling him like, you know, Tama Tonga's contract's coming up, and I I think Tama's a a full blown uh, can't miss if 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 you ask me. And he and he wrote back right away, and then you know it took uh, you know a, a year to, to to get it done. But like I said, I'm a big believer in, in stuff happening for a reason, and now he's here. And yeah, the the changes and being able, you know, somebody called me. I think Vic called me the machine gun on NXT recently, and like that. Even just hearing that's kind of still kind of crazy. And being able to debut in you know in 2016 as Anderson and Gallows, kind of uh, you know Luke Gallows and, and Carl Anderson was always was, was kind of trippy to me that we were able to keep all those names and they referenced the bullet club a couple of times. It's, it's uh, I think dude, especially with the way WWE is right now, it's, it's crazy. This more open-minded approach that triple H seems to be bringing to the table. Do you think it's because 
he was one of the boys and he gets it and understands it? Or do you think it's more of a position of the WWE is untouchable? Nothing is going to affect the WWE in one way, shape, or form. If you go work in Japan, it's not going to affect the WWE. So might as well let the boys go do what they want to do. Because if the boys are happy, they're going to be happy here. Well, you know, I I got the opportunity to uh, team with with Triple H in Japan. Me, AJ, Gallows, and Triple H teamed in basically his last match in Japan. I think it was 2019. And it was just cool to watch Hunter prepare for that match and talk about the spots and, and go over it all in the same time that we're talking about a contract. I think Triple H, obviously, coming up in the business the way he did, being a wrestler, he knows how all of our minds are. He knows he knows what we want. He knows who how all of us want. Like when people talk about wanting something more of a storyline, you know, they have some – I'm noticing a lot of people do ask me what they think they should do. And I remember, and I always say, listen, man, like you can text Hunter all you want, but like Hunter understands what we're all going through. Like, so if you want to text him, that's fine. But I, I wouldn't bother Hunter with that kind of stuff all the time because Hunter knows what we're all going through. So it, it, yeah, yes, he's one of the, he is one of the wrestlers that came up through, you know, uh, all aspects of the business. And now he's obviously where he is. It's I'm excited for the future, man. It's funny listening to you both talk about it as professional wrestlers because, again, as the fan, I feel like Triple H understands the pro wrestling fan in 2024. We're not idiots. This is the era of the internet, social media. I think the fans are pretty smart now about what exactly is going on with the landscape of pro wrestling. So it would come off almost disingenuous if you didn't acknowledge the things that were happening around and even in the history of pro wrestling. So I feel like Triple H is tapping into the fan as well. So it's funny how you guys are talking about it being in a relatable way as a professional wrestler, but I also feel like Triple H is relating to the pro wrestling fan too. Yeah, but a hundred percent. And I mean, and especially nowadays, you know, I, I can still remember back to 2012. I think it was September or October. We went live on the New Japan pay per view, and it was like one of the first times that I think New Japan World had been uh, invented. And so people started to see what we were doing then. And then now, I, I think with you know the way digital stuff is now, I think it's kind of it would be kind of crazy to not acknowledge you know certain things because there's just so much going on and so many different things coming around and not, and to not, you know, acknowledge what Tama Tonga has done for the, all those years over there. It's, you know, it's yeah, exactly. It's, it sounds crazy saying this, but I, but I do believe what I'm about to say is that I feel like we got this new era in the WWE. A lot of it has to do with the fact that we got the bullet club back in the day. If you really look at the timeline, Carl, of when the bullet club started, how big the bullet club got, how it bled into the culture here in America to the, to the point that Bullet Club t-shirts were being sold at Hot Topic in the mall. Like, I really felt like that little tiny conversation that you had with Prince Devitt turned into seriously changing the landscape of how people viewed professional wrestling, how it made professional wrestling cool again. And I do feel like we're kind of bearing the fruit of your labors you know, a decade ago. I, I, I like to think of it that way. I, I like to think of it as just having the opportunity in, in New Japan to just be able to just kind of say whatever we wanted to say at that time without any repercussions because I was able to cut a promo and not yeah, – that's why – I'm sorry. That's why when I came to WWE and I kind of had scripted promos at first, it was just kind of uh, – well, I wasn't sure about it. I didn't know how to do it. I've never really done it before because New Japan, I just would sit down and start talking. And that's kind of like what we were able to do in New Japan to just be able to just to be who we are and talk talk crap and, and say anything we wanted. And so I think that's where I remember I got a DM from Bray Wyatt and uh, messaging me like, man, this Bullet Club stuff is crazy, man. Like you guys look like you're having the greatest time of your lives. And it's like, yeah, we were, I mean, we were having a lot of fun, but we wanted to make a lot more money. We, we were, we wanted to come to WWE at some point or something, you know, 
but it, it yeah, I, I'm glad that we're all together where we're at. And it, 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 you know, it's a fun time in our in our career. Carl, one last question for me about the Bullet Club. Uh, lately, we've been talking about jump the shark moments in uh, in wrestling. When was the jump the shark moment, if if there was any, in your opinion, for the Bullet Club? Man, you mean like when it when it took off, or when you could just feel like it it hit no, something right? No, when you when you felt like it was it, it was it was starting to hit the the, the, the oh outside. down. Yeah, yeah. When was <laughs> so, that moment? Was ah uh, maybe we shouldn't have did that. You know, it, 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 there was a time in uh, at Corican Hall. Prince Devitt had just won something. And he told me he was going to do this. And I said, I don't think you're going to really, you should do this, you know. And he grabbed Sugaba Ashisan, who is the president of New Japan Pro Wrestling. He, they were handing Prince Devitt, uh, they were handing Finn Balor the trophy. Finn, you guys can go back and watch it, look it up. He grabs Sugabashi and throws him on the ground and starts putting like the, like the, you know, a finger into his forehead. Sugabashi was not selling it. He wasn't happy. He was half smiling, and you can see all the cameras on there. We came back. We went out to we went out to eat. We still didn't think anything of it. And then Gato, Gato called us and goes, "Boys, please, please never touch Sugabashi again. I get big trouble." <laughs> I said, "Oh, sorry, sorry. Let me, <laughs> hey, Sugabashi, son, you are you are free from us. My apologies." <laughs> All right, so let me take the other side of that, which you first thought Bully was going to ask. When was the moment for you when you're like, wow, we're really on to something here. This is something really huge. You know, it, 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 right away it felt really cool. It felt fun. It was exciting. I will say this, when Finn Balor signed with NXT, with WWE and he was leaving, and then AJ Styles came over, and I was always a big fan of AJ Styles, but like, you know, people might not have known exactly who AJ was in Japan yet. But when AJ Styles came over to to New Japan Pro Wrestling and got in in that full time with us, and it was the AJ Styles era of of Bullet Club, where AJ Styles was the big guy, the, the Young Bucks, me and Gallows, Tama, Fale. I mean, I, and Kenny was the, the the junior weight champion at that point. I mean, that's when the new shirt came out, and bam, this this thing exploded and i think it did a lot of awesome stuff for aj styles too and all of a sudden all of us just started to feel like this is this is kind of uh crazy well carl i'm I'm looking forward first of all i'm looking forward to nxt tonight carmelo hayes and trick williams in a steel cage on nxt tonight we'll be watching it tonight we'll be talking about it myself bully and tommy dreamer on a wednesday edition of busted open but this bloodline story it, it's all the turns, the curves, the changing of chapters to a new chapter. I said it, and I'll say it again. I've been watching pro wrestling for almost 43 years now. This is one of the best, if not the best story that I've ever seen as a fan. So the fact that we're not adding to, but even replacing characters in the story, it's been tremendous. And and Carl, thank you for giving us the time this morning and talking about Tama and NXT. And we can't wait to see what's next in your career. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. And uh, I'm, I'm ecstatic to watch Tama, watch him grow and, uh, and just watch this. So I appreciate thanks. you guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks brother. You appreciate it. you.